everybody, welcome back to the Medical Projects YouTube channel. If you are new around here, my name is Olivia and I'm a second year medical student at King's College London. And here on the Medical Projects YouTube channel, we are dedicated to creating high yield videos to help you and your medical school application so that you can secure your dream spot at medical school. So if you do like the sound of that, as always, please do make sure you are subscribed to our YouTube channel, turn on the notification bell so that you can be notified when we post, and also make make sure to follow us over on all our social media links, they will be in the description box below. Now as I'm filming this, it is early February, which means it is still just about interview season. And you guys loved our mock MMI video I did with Lizzie, so we decided to do a part two of that video. So today we're going to be answering even more medicine mock MMI style questions. I am going to be answering the questions today, so I hope you enjoy watching me suffer on the spot. But these are some of the sorts of questions that you might get in your own interview. So I hope that by watching this video you're able to gather some more tips and tricks for how to answer these kind of questions. We've got another role play in there for you because I know a lot of you guys were worried about role play stations so I really hope you find this video informative and useful. Please say a massive thank you again to Lizzie in the comments down below because she's really helped me out but without further ado let's get on with the mock MMI part two. Hello Olivia it's lovely to meet you um, I hope you're doing well today. Um, if you don't mind I'm just gonna cut to the chase and and ask our first question so obviously it's lovely to meet you but um what is it that you think you can bring to medicine why should we pick you so um I think there are many qualities I have that are quite unique to me and the experiences I've had growing up the first one is that I'd say I'm a really good communicator um I've had lots of work experience up until this point now where I worked in a palliative care hospice which meant I was having you know, quite difficult conversations with patients about how they were feeling. Um, I've done some volunteering abroad in Vietnam where I've been helping little children learn basic kind of English, um, which means I've had to adapt to my communication approach. And I think that my experiences um, doing this has just meant that I've really kind of finessed my communication skills. And that's definitely one of my strengths. Um, another reason I think you should pick me is because I have a real strong interest in research. Um, I'm actually a graduate applying, so I did a degree in biomedical sciences, and I know that King's is very um, into their research, and they, they really like taking those research opportunities, and I think that's definitely something I'd like to take up in the future. Um, and also, I'm someone who's lived abroad in three different countries, and again, I think that's just helped me improve my communication skills and I think that alongside my very um, disciplined nature and very self-motivated nature will mean that I'll really succeed in the academic side of medicine but also in the social uh, communication side of medicine. Brilliant I think that's um it's good that you honed in on on communication so much of what we do is about communication so it's obviously um, it's an important facet of medicine would you say that's the most important trait or the the most significant trait that you have i i think there are lots of things that you can could consider are the most important trait um obviously it's important to be kind of um very meticulous with your work and try and piece together you know what's going on with a patient's diagnosis for example that is extremely important um but i would say to me, the core of being a good doctor is having good communication skills because it's not you're not just considering the communication with your patients. Um, that is, of course, really important. Um, but in medicine, you're working as part of a multidisciplinary team. So you're going to need to communicate with nurses and various other healthcare professionals. Um, so I think that is just as important. And I think if you're unable to work together as a team and communicate effectively, um, whatever you do, the patient care will not be at its kind of optimum. So I, I do think personally that is the most important trait. Yeah, great. Um, and, and actually that brings me on to the next question that I wanted to ask you, which is about how do you think that you would talk to or approach one of your colleagues if they were acting inappropriately? So if they were saying, for example, some things that seemed discriminatory towards other members of the team or even patients, how might you approach and, and talk to them about that? Or would you? Yeah. Um, so I think these situations, they are obviously very difficult. Um, they are often very uncomfortable. And I think especially if it's a colleague you're quite close to, it can be quite difficult sometimes to broach these situations. Um, 
But I think because we are working as professionals and because we have a duty of care, I do obviously recognise that this would be a real issue that needed to be addressed. I think the first thing I would do is, um, you know, if I witness this myself, I think I would find a time, an appropriate time to pull this colleague aside um, and just say, you know, I, I heard the discriminatory comments you were saying and I think it was highly unprofessional of you. And I think I just remind um, my colleague about the code of conduct, um, which they should be abiding by. And I'd remind them that if I were to hear this again um, and it was becoming a regular occurrence that, you know, I would have to escalate this to a senior because ultimately, you know, it's bad enough me hearing it, but if a, if a patient were to hear this and this wasn't nipped in the bud, then it could really affect the, the patient-doctor relationship and that would be really detrimental. Yeah, brilliant. I think that it's such an important thing to make sure that we are watching out and, and thinking about the general atmosphere that's also within medicine um, and making sure that we're improving that. Good. So those are quite sort of specific things and they're about how you communicate and how you um, would approach medicine um, thinking about sort of broader society. Yeah. What do you think are the kind of greatest challenges to modern day medicine? What do you think are the, the issues that are facing us? Um, yeah, well, I think um, unfortunately we do have quite a few issues um, in our healthcare system now and as a society, I guess I can talk about these in the context of the NHS because we're constantly hearing about, you know, the pressures that the NHS is under. I'd say on a broader scale, we have quite a problem with obesity levels. There is an obesity crisis at the moment. And I think that has many knock on health effects as well, um, such as high blood pressure. I read a paper that it, it increases your chances of certain cancers. So I think that is that is definitely something that needs to be addressed. Um, and I think alongside that, we have very high rates of type 2 diabetes, which also, you know, is increasing rapidly. And that's also something we probably need to hone in on. Other problems I think we're facing as a society in the context of healthcare is that we have a increasingly elderly population. Um, and, you know, they all have they often have complex healthcare needs. A lot of them will have chronic conditions. And obviously there are only a finite amount of resources we have in the NHS. So that is something that um, is, is very difficult to cope with. And I think is something that puts the NHS under a lot of pressure. And then also just things like, um, you know, very high waiting times in A&E. Um, I think I read that they've been the highest they've been since 2008 and obviously, during times like this COVID pandemic, that's that's not going to help. And so I think some ways we can address these is firstly, in terms of specific healthcare uh, conditions, um, we can increase education on, on these conditions and increase awareness of the adverse health effects of obesity and you know, make make that information more accessible to people from a young age. And then I guess in terms of an elderly population, it's a difficult one and I'm not sure there is a specific answer for it. I think to address the issue of an elderly population, it's very difficult and I, I'm not sure we even know what we can do about it at this point. Um, but I guess just trying to care for patients wherever possible in the comfort of their own home and try and do whatever we can to keep them out of care homes unless absolutely necessary. Um, so maybe increase the supply of nursing assistants and care assistants so that they can care for patients from their home and make that a bit more accessible because I know those care packages can be quite difficult to obtain. And then for waiting times in the NHS and A&E and whatnot, perhaps we could outsource some of our services a bit more. So um, maybe we could uh, increase the provision of local services so that people aren't going to, you know, the hospitals and GPs unnecessarily. But very difficult. I don't think there's any any one answer. Yeah, and I think you're right to recognise that a lot of these things can be improved by preventative measures um, and education, especially that is something that we we sort of look for health improvements in. Okay, Olivia, so for the final question, I'd like to ask you um, about a role play situation. Um, so you are the doctor in this situation um, and I am the patient. I have come in previously for a smear test, um, which is to check for um, abnormalities um, in the cervix. 
and have been informed that that was normal and that there was no abnormalities by the nurse. However, um, you have found that there is a cause for concern and for further tests. So you have got to rectify that situation with me. Um, so I'm coming in to, to have that explained to me, have that result explained to me. Okay. okay. If you want to think for a little while, that's fine. Um, but then please start off when you're ready. Hello, um, is this uh, Lizzie that I'm speaking to? Uh, yeah, hi. Hi, nice to talk to you. I'm Dr. Parkinson. I'm just ringing from the surgery. So I just wanted to check. I believe you spoke to one of my colleagues, the nurse, last Friday. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. And do you mind if I just ask, can I check your understanding over what you discussed in that, in that telephone consultation? Yeah, no problem. So I came in for a smear last Monday and then um, the nurse phoned me to tell me that my result was normal and there's no need to worry. So that's, that's all really. Okay, perfect. Thank you for letting me know. So what this conversation is going to be about is just a follow up from that conversation you had with my colleague, because I'm very, very sorry to tell you that there has been a bit of a mishap with uh, your results. And unfortunately, they did get slightly mixed up with another patient's. And so I, I can only apologise for this situation, but it does mean that we do need to do some further investigations because your results are looking a little bit abnormal. Right, sorry. Um, that was all just a bit overwhelming. So you're saying that I... So the, the nurse phoned me on Friday and she said she was pretty adamant that they were all fine and I didn't need to like, worry at all. So you're saying that then they're, they're not okay? So... As you said, uh, she was under the impression that they were okay, but unfortunately it was because there was just a bit of a mishap with the patient records and they did get slightly confused and we are informing the other patient. I do want to reassure you that that is also taking place. And yes, indeed, what you're saying is correct. We are not sure if they are normal, so we do need to do some further investigations because we can't say for certain that they are normal from this set of results. Okay, so so am I okay, or like did, you like said there needed to be further investigations? Like, what's going to happen? How's that going to work? I'm just a bit I'm a bit thrown, to be honest. Of course, and that's completely understandable, and I can totally appreciate that this is a really stressful bit of news to hear, and I can I can only apologise and sympathise with how you're feeling. Um, I I wish this didn't happen. It's very stressful. But I think the best thing we can do moving forward is to do some more tests because I can't comment on whether you have a normal set of results or not until we get those further tests. I do want to reassure you that um, this abnormality we have picked up is not a confirmed diagnosis of anything. So what we need to do is just follow that up so that you can have more information and more peace of mind or um, it can point us in the, in the next direction that we need to go in um, and the next steps that we should be taking. Okay, it just feels quite sort of, I don't know, unorganised or like, I don't know, feels like, how do I know that what you're telling me is true if you don't know what, whose tests are whose? So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, can, I can completely understand why you feel this way. Um, and I, I do want to just try and reassure you that this is a very rare occurrence and so moving forward um, we can hope that this won't happen again obviously I'm, I'm not going to say to you it never will happen again uh, we will take every necessary precaution and we will we will try and ensure to the best of our ability that moving forwards uh, this does not happen again because I can like I said appreciate that this has been extremely stressful for you um, so so I can only apologize once again okay um, thank you Thank you for calling me. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I recognise that that's quite a hard thing to do. Um, but really, it's sort of focusing on communication, which is so much of what we do. So those are all the questions we're going to be answering in today's Mock MMI video. I hope you guys found this useful. I found it really tricky. Um, I think some of these questions were really challenging, but I hope they taught you something and I hope you were able to think about some of the answers that you might give. Before we end this video, I would just like to say that Medical Projects offers their own mock MMI service. So if you want to have an online mock medicine interview, 
do check out the link in the description box. It's a really fantastic resource and just allows you to feel that much more confident in your real interview and you'll be able to get some really detailed feedback for yourself so that you know how to improve in your real interview. Thank you guys so much for watching. Do make sure you have subscribed to our channel if you haven't already and I will see you in another video very soon. Bye!